Hi there, it's Adam Smith, head of Sky Sports and Boxing, and you're watching Lights Out. This is Fessel Khan for Lights Out, and this is the Lights Out Boxing Podcast, podcast number 32. Um, with me, delighted to be joined by fellow Lights Out team members, Mohsin Gulshir and Asif Khan. Uh, I'm supposed to have Josh Syed from the Good Boxing Podcast join us, but God knows where Josh has got to. Um, obviously, he's based in America, so... He's on a different time scale, so hopefully he can join us at some point. If not, it'll just have to be the trio that's been with Lights Out since day one. Uh, before we get started, to the viewers out there, if they haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, make sure you check us out on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you want to listen to this podcast in any of the audio platforms, make sure you check out the links in the description. Um, let's get started. I'm going to label this podcast as controversial City weekend because we had some great boxing action, but we also had some controversial decisions, which is obviously what we'll be talking about today. We'll start with last night's action in Manchester in the heavyweight division. Uh, Joseph Parker scraped a points decision victory over Derek War Chisora. Um, not just did we have a points decision controversy, but there's a lot of controversy leading up to the fight, especially with the infamous coin toss. Now, um, let's talk a bit about the main event. Uh, as I mentioned, Joseph Parker won via a points decision. But was it the right decision? I'm going to start off and I'm going to say I thought Derek Chisora won that fight and I thought he won it by at least two rounds. Your thoughts on last night's main event in Manchester in the heavyweight division? If you're asking me, I, I had it as a draw, uh, to be honest. You know, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I had it as a draw. Um, it was a typical Chisora performance. You know, we started off, you know, kind of the come forward fighter, putting the pressure on, uh, throwing those right overhands. Uh, started off, I mean, the, he had a dream start, the first round, first 10 seconds, and he gets a knockdown. Um, but then, uh, sadly, this has been the story of Chisora's kind of career where he seems to tank out after the first five or six rounds. I mean, same thing happened against Usyk. We've seen that happen against uh, Dillian White. We've seen that happen against uh, Tyson Fury, where he was on, you know, it was a shame. You know, there was very little coming back from him. Um, and I think Parker, I mean, it wasn't a great fight for, for him, but he did the basics well. So I think there's very little coming from Chisora. I had it as a draw. That that's how I would have. I thought that would have been a fair result. As if your thoughts on the main event and the decision last night, the end decision. I I don't think I've done enough to win the fight convincingly. I think you know if it would have went the other way, I don't think Parker would have complained. Um, which is always always going to always feels like the whole world's against him. You know he started well within seven seconds, he got the knockdown, and then there's a typical Derek Chisora performance. You know you can you can pretty much. You know, tell in advance what Chisora's going to do. Attack the body, go to the head. He done that the whole fight, but there were rounds where he didn't do enough, in my opinion. And I think Locker nicked it. You know, just by the basics, the jab, um, trying to keep it out of range. And then I thought in the the championship right round as well, maybe round ten and eleven. I think mm. Parker done enough to to win them rounds as well. Um, so I, I, it was a close fight, and I don't think you know I heard the the word robbery and that. I don't think. Either plane, if it you know, whatever way it went, that they were robbed. No, yeah, I don't think it was a great fight, but no. I do think the decision was wrong. Um, and mm. I actually felt a bit sorry for Chisora in the end because I just wasn't impressed with Joseph Parker. Last, I was I've not been impressed with Joseph Parker since the Joshua fight. I thought he was lucky to get a decision against uh, Junior Far. Um, I thought Anthony Joshua, he was saying during the week that the referee didn't allow him to get going. I don't buy that. And I thought the Huey Fury fight, the performance against Huey Fury wasn't really good. I'm just, I, it just, I'm just, it's, I, I struggle to get impressed by uh, Joseph Park. And I thought teaming up with Andy Lee and um, joining Tyson Fury in camp leading up to his fight, we might see something different, but wasn't really impressed with Joseph Parker. Uh, as you said, as if it was a typical Derek Chisora performance, 
And obviously, as Ron said, the second half of the fight, which we've seen it from time and time again, it just sort of fades away, especially in those mid championship rounds. Uh, but being 37 years old, you can't knock the guy. He's fought everybody, regardless of how many decisions he's had go for him. He's still got a very, you know what? I get a bit of controversy for saying this, but he's got a better CV than most heavyweights. Even though he's lost most of these big fights, he's still got in the ring and done what he's had to do. Yeah, yeah, like, that, like you said, it's, 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 a, it's, you know, it's not a winning CV, is it? It's, uh, mm. he's a challenger. It, you know, he's, he's, he has become a gatekeeper, you know? Yeah, um, agreed. To get to that yeah. next level, these heavyweights are all just, they're, they're all, they're all match themselves up against him. I think he, I don't think he minds having that title. I don't think he does, you know, of, of being that kind of fighter. He gets paid. He said it, you know, he said it openly, but I'm not in the, the love of the game. I'm in it for the money. So fair dues for money. He, he, the main event of, of, a, of a box office event, you know, I think people would, would probably disagree with that. But, you know, Derek Chisora is what Derek Chisora is. Would you not want to see a rematch? Because he said to Eddie Hearn last night, and Eddie Hearn actually turned around and said I had Chisora winning that fight. So that says a lot for me. You know, especially with Eddie Hearn looking after Joseph Parker, promoting him. He come out and he said I had Chisora winning that fight last night. Chisora said he wants Does to... he promote him? Yeah. And Chisora said... Uh, he... Okay. Chisora said can, he... I, can I answer that? Um, no. I mean, it wasn't... I mean, it was like you, like you said, it wasn't a great watch. Uh, it was a poor performance by Parker. I thought... You know, he's young still. He's only 29, 30. Um, and, you know, if he wanted to make a statement, you know, it would have been uh, to knock out, um, you know, a Chisora. But what does, Chis- you know, what does, you know, uh, Parker get out of this? He has a rematch with him. Yeah, he wins a bit more convincingly. But it just kind of slows down his progress. You know, he, I'm sure he wants to be up there winning a world title again. I think his next fight, uh, I would honestly put build him up towards uh, fighting Usyk. Um, that would be a that would, I'd I'd rather watch. I'd prefer that than watching that again. I don't I don't know what was where Chisora is. It Chisora just after another payday again? So you know he doesn't want. He's not a, a world title contender by any means. So well, not for me. Either way, I think there will be a rematch. Joseph Parker. So yeah. Chisora wants it on the Fury Joshua undercard if and when that does get announced. But I think there will be a rematch. I think rightfully so. I think it's a wrong decision. I think Chisora's mm. is slightly hard done by. Uh, let's see. But we'll move on. We'll talk about the co main event, which I thought was fight of the night. Uh, Katie Taylor retained her undisputed mm. lightweight Great women's fight. championship against Natasha Jonas. Brilliant fight. 100% agree with you, Asif. Um, fight of the night for me, but another close decision for Katie Taylor. Now, there's a lot of back and forth on Twitter today about the Katie Taylor and Natasha Jonas decision. But what did you guys make of the overall decision? Do you think the judges got it right or do you think it was a draw at best? Uh, yeah, I, I, I had Katie Taylor win that. I think, you know what, that's one of the fights. You know, the Chisora Park is different, right? So Katie Taylor's undisputed champion, holds all the belts. You have to take them belts. You have to do enough. You can't just try and nick it. You're not going to nick it against someone like Katie Taylor, regardless if it's in Manchester when you're from Liverpool. And I don't think um, John's done that. Um, she had she had burst. I mean, when she let her hands go, she she looked like she was she was uh, she was doing some damage, but it wasn't often enough in the rounds. I mean she kept coming back to the corner and, and giving her own score prediction. She was like, I'm five three down, I'm five, six three down. Even in her own score prediction, she was never up. Um, so, yeah, I think the right result was... Uh, I think that was the right result. Ron, um, do you agree with the end decision in the end, or do you think Natasha Jonas deserved a draw at least? Um, I think what won it for Katie Taylor was the last two rounds, really. It was it was really close. I think Taylor, Taylor started off the better one, won the first four or five rounds. But then Jonas was coming back. The work rate was there. Um, but you could see that Katie Taylor was a more accomplished fighter, more accuracy. Every time Katie Taylor would land three or four, Jonas would land one or two. So 
oh, you know, again, you know, not take nothing away from those both those ladies. That was a, a you know an excellent fight, and Natasha Jonas just showed us that she belongs at that level. You know, um, and you know, it was a harsh, you know, for her to you know put all that effort in and just come up short, unfortunately. But she is at that she's at that backstage of her career. Um, you know, maybe one more fight. You know, would, 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 I'd love to see Natasha Jonas against her. T- that rematch with Terry Harper maybe down the line uh, or maybe a Delphine Pursoon. See, you know, there's, I mean, there's some good names there in that division, that lightweight, women's lightweight division. That- uh, do you know what? To be honest, I'm getting sick and tired of seeing Katie Taylor get these close decisions. I mean, I thought <laughs> years ago, she... You don't think she won that? No, I thought it was a draw. And to be honest with you, uh, I, she got I think the last two rounds for me, I, I, Katie Adam. I thought she got very lucky you know in, in yeah. New York a couple of years ago in the first fight. Yes, game. yes. I just think she gets hand fed results. Uh, I listen, I respect her as a fighter. She's done a lot in British, but she is definitely put women's boxing on the map. I don't, I don't discourage her for that. But for me, she, I don't even watch her results anymore because when, when it's a close fight, you just know they're going to give it a decision. And that just really pisses me off. Like, because she's a face of women's boxing in, in the UK. I wouldn't say overall, because for me, the biggest face in women's boxing is uh, Clar- 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 Clarissa Shield in World's Women Boxing. But it's just every close decision. I don't even watch the judges, uh, and the ring announcement of who's won the fight. Because for me, she just gets every close decision. And it's just getting to a point now where you're thinking, What's the point? I actually thought it was a draw last night. I hope there's a rematch. And I think Natasha Jonas beat a rematch because I think Natasha Jonas gave her the best fight that anyone's given. And that's including the likes of the Delphine Pursuits as well. So I do think mm. Natasha Jonas, if there's a rematch, I think Natasha Jonas does beat her. But I will say one thing though. Last night was a box office event. That fight should have been made event. If, it's, if we're talking mm-hmm. about undisputed women's title, especially with someone like Katie Taylor, who's been built up so big as she is. That fight for me all day long should have been the main event. But look, great fight, great co main event. Um, Eddie Hearn said that he'd love to see him do it again. And that's a fight you need to put in a with crowd. And I personally, for me, the Fury Joshua undercard, again, when it does get announced, is slowly building itself. And that's a fight I'd put on the undercard. But let's move on because there was obviously uh, the return of Asif's guy, Chris Eubat Jr. last night. Um, Return with a points decision win against Marcus Morrison. Whoa, whoa. Oh, well, Asif, take it away. What Go on, Asif. I'll, I'm not going to say anything here. On the uh, Eubat Jr.'s performance last night. Wow, what can I say? Performance of the night. Now, listen, it wasn't, do you know what? It wasn't vintage Chris Eubank. Yeah, you could see the slight few adjustments that have, you know, he's brought into his game. He was a lot more patient, I think, first round. I don't even think he threw, threw a punch, which is very unrare for, uh, you know, it's very rare for you, man, Junior. And then second round, man, you know, you just, listen, I know what people say, he gets caught, you know, that fight against, you know, Morrison, he shouldn't have been caught, you know, they're not even in the same level, but that's what he does, man. He's that entertaining fight. He's always going to get caught. That's his, I mean, you you message in the group first and say, he gets caught, he gets hit too much on that, but he he's always going to get hit too much because he's that kind of fighter and, I love watching him fight, man. I isn't there's never a dull moment. You know that second round, yeah, before he went and nearly stopped him. He's he's, he's shouting out to I think it was his sister or something. Like, don't worry, baby, I got this. His entertainment, man. And throughout that whole card, that was the only fight which yeah. Listen, the Katie Taylor was a great fight, but the Eubank Junior fight was 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 the one fight where I couldn't take my eyes off it. So um, yeah, man, I was I was pleased with the performance. Ron, what was your thoughts on the Eubank Jr.'s first performance under Roy Jones Jr. last night? Did you see any different? Did you see anything <laughs> made you think, yeah, there is a slight change? Uh, the adjustments man, are- I, it, I thought it was uh, Roy Jones coming back in, into the ring again because, you know, that swagger, that head movement. Uh, you know, obviously, he's not going to have that same agility as uh, the great Roy Jones, but... Out of the, all the boxing analysts that I love and admire, Roy Jones Jr. is the best. I think, you know, we, we, when I remember, you know, listening to him and what better advice to have in the corner when you go in the, you know, when you go uh, for your timeout. 
uh, yeah, it was uh, as you've said. Yeah, you know, it was a lot more patient. It was a lot more measured. I love that he wasn't rushing it. He was kind of, you know, you'd have his flurry of punches. Then he'd go for a little walk, and then you'd you know have his little flurry of punches again. Um, and yes, Eubank does take them. You know, what I mean, but he has been blessed with a good chin. He's a very solid chin. I think that, you know, his dad was the same as well. Um, mm. the, I mean, th- one of the downsides, I mean, with Eubank Jr., I think if he can improve his, is his slow footwork. I think that's something, uh, you know, he's not, be- he's not been blessed with. But saying that, he's got great hands. He's got very heavy hands. And, mm. you know, he loves throwing those combinations. And I do love his uppercuts that he does throw. It kind of it gets in, squeezes in there. I think what he said, and I, re- I think he could have blasted him out early, but he wanted to get the rounds in. It's been two years since he's actually, um, since he's actually had a fight. Probably, I mean, yeah. you know, the last fight was Matt Lobov, or I forgot, I forgot his name in the US. Yeah. Horrible. Um, and he hasn't fought since, and COVID has affected him. So it was good for him to see him to get ten rounds. I mean, let's see what happens next. All right. Well, do uh, you know what? Right, I I look, I criticize you, Matt Junior, because you he, you know he's got the talent. I not deny he's got the talent, right? But he's a fighter, in my opinion, that has not reached his full potential yet. No, wait, wait. Let, me, let me let me let me jump in. One second. Right. So you say he's a talent, yeah, but he's thirty-one years old. All right. Talent. I think he's past that stage of us saying he's a talent. He is what he is, yeah. He isn't gonna get any any better, in my opinion. I don't think Roy Jones is trying to make him into Roy Jones. The best thing they could do for Chris Eubank Jr. is just let him do what he does. And I I honestly feel right if he fought someone like an Andrade, I think he'd beat him. Do you know what? I don't disagree with you about the Andrade prediction. I think he can beat most heavy, most middleweight, right? But for me. It, what summed up Eubank Jr. is, is uh, during the press conference, Callis Allen, who obviously promotes him, said that after the Groves fight, I went up to him and said, you've got everything in your locker. You just do not have the guy in your corner. That's all you need. Yeah. Now, yeah, you're right. He's 31 years old. But when you're being mentored by someone like Roy Jones Jr., you expected to, to see a little bit, a little bit more and I wasn't that impressed with his performance last night. What for me would have been impressive was if he made a statement last night. Now, in the second round, the second round for me is where he should have finished the fight. He's been out, well, of, I think, no, he's been I out, think, out of the ring for two years. Yeah. No, that's all. I'm sorry. He, he yeah. needed those rounds. He yeah. needed those and, rounds, man. And Ron, he, he made that point as well. He said after the fight, if I would have knocked this guy out in two rounds, everyone would have said, okay, well, you've just who have you knocked out. We'd be having the same conversation, like, oh, yeah, he knocked someone out in the second round, but who was this person? He's a no one that he knocked out. They weren't on the same level. He got the rounds in. You know, like he said, the most important thing for him was was going back to the corner and listening to Roy John's advice. He hasn't had that. And I think that's where the improvement is, if any. Mm. He's got someone he can go back into the corner with and actually listen to. And like he said, he's listened to someone that's been there, done that, and has the world title to prove it. So he's taken it on board. So I think, you know, the next fight is will be a step up. And I honestly think that he, he could become a world champion. I, do you know what, right? With, with, with him, is you need to remember one thing. is uh, The way I feel sorry for him is he, he gets put under a lot of pressure because of the name. But the simple fact is, with Chris Eubank Jr. is, yeah, the, the most frustrating thing about him is he is very talented. And you know he's capable of achieving something in the sport. If he retired tomorrow, he's not had a good career because I don't consider an IBO as a as one of the main belts. What gets me with you, Matt Junior, is is he going to fulfil his full potential? Is he is this whole you know relationship with Roy Jones Junior? Is it going to be a long term thing? Is he going to be willing to drop his ego and listen to Roy Jones Junior? You know, I, for, for me last night, I didn't see much improvement. I didn't see much difference with him. I think defensively, he's not as good as he... Well, he's never been that good for me. I don't think he's improved on his defensive work. I don't think he's improved on his footwork. I think if he fought someone like a Golovkin, I think it's tailor-made for Golovkin to beat him. 
I think the other three champions in the division, the Charlos, the Andrades and the Maratas, he'd probably beat. But let's be completely honest with each other, though. Andrade, no one really wait, rates him as a world champion. Charlo's not really fought anybody. Murata's lost, I think, four fights. The main fight now for me, Eubank Jr. has to be targeting, is a Golovkin fight. And I think if you if you base it on last night, I think Golovkin would easily beat him because I just don't see much difference. So the next question is, does he stay and have a few more fights, perhaps against the likes of maybe the Liam Williams or the Kel Brooks, or does he dive into a Golovkin fight? Because that was what you said he wants next. End of the year, he wants Golovkin. Would it be the right time to put him in with a Golovkin or do you think he needs one or two more fights under Roy Jones Jr. with perhaps a better, better opponent? Um, I think, listen, I think the Kell Brook and Liam Williams fight makes a lot more sense. The Triple G fight, how, how, how old is Triple G now? What, what, 30, must be? 38, I think 38, 39. 38. So, so as every year passes, he gets a bit older and, and probably when, you know, if he does fight him end of the year next year, you know, he, he might have a bit more advantage. But I think the Kell Brook fight, I like the sound of it. There's a bit of needle there. Um, the Liam Williams fight as well, again, there's a there's a bit of needle there. So I wouldn't throw him in just yet. I don't think Triple G would even want to fight him because what does Triple G gain out of it? Um, probably not enough. Um, so I think Eubank's going to have to force his hand, maybe with a world title um, on the line. And then, you know, maybe we'll see that fight. He's been calling for that fight, you know, since when he was with Eddie Hearn. So maybe he's just calling for that, you know, just to try and stay relevant. But I think we'll see him fight for a world title, you know, towards the end of the year. Ron, if you're kind of sound, do you put you back in with a Golovkin at the end of the year, based on last night? <sighs> I mean, Eubank sells. So regardless of mm. whoever you put him in with, you know, people will watch it. So Callis Island, um, I'd I'd like to see him one more fight. I'd like I, uh, if I me personally as a fan, I do like Eubank. Um, I'd like to see him with a Morata, maybe because Golovkin and Canelo they're on a different level in that middleweight division. So it's a different kettle of fish there. But he's always been confident with that fight. He's always he's been running after that fight for a very long time. But that's the that's the money fight. That's the one that people want to see. Is you know, it, will Eubank Junior ever fulfil his true potential? Because let's be honest, the two times he's come up against world level opposition, we know what, what's happened. I'm sorry, Asif, but your uh, your boy hasn't delivered. So you know, and but you know, let's let's give him one more fight under Roy Jones Junior refine his skills, give him another, you know, a credible opponent that's going to give him rounds. And then we can have a look and assess whether he's ready for a Glovkin. And he'll, he'll headline that event as well. You know, with that in, you know, you in Wembley or somewhere, that sells out, in my you, opinion. You'll know more about Eubank Jr. when he does get in with a world-class opponent, whether this relationship with Roy Jones Jr. is working. But I'd say mm. off to Marcus Morrison as well because he's got nothing to be ashamed of. I thought he put in a good performance. Uh, he took some big punches, but he also landed some big punches. Good chin, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's mm. one of those fighters I'd like to see on a matchroom card again because he put up a good performance last night. Let's take nothing away from him. But Asif, before we obviously move on to the next topic, if you're Callis Island right now, what's the next fight you're making for Eubank Jr.? The next three fights. Williams. Because I think there's that common... Because after that, I'd put him in with Andrade. And so I think Williams is that common factor. You know, Andrade fought him, um, put Eubank in with him. And then I'd fight, get, get him in with Andrade. It's an easy fight to happen. You know, um, Hearn said himself, he, he wouldn't mind bringing him over to the UK. So, and then, you know, if he comes through them two fights, then put him in with Triple G. Exciting. That would be my, my, my thoughts here. Exciting times ahead because, you know what, listen... Regardless of what we think of him, he's still a big name in boxing. And he he is... Listen, he's, I, I don't take nothing away from him in terms of entertaining. He will throw everything, including the kitchen sink at him. But I just also think there's a time and a place to go gung-ho. And I think in fights like Golovkin and the Canelos, this is when you have to be on your A-game. And we talk about being on your A-game, we'll know more next Saturday night because when Billy Joe Saunders is the man to the front Canelo, we're going to eat those words. But anyway, that's for next week's podcast. Let's move on. Let's talk about another fight on that card. Dimitri Bivol retained his WBA light heavyweight title with a points decision win against the spider Craig Richards. Now, 
a lot of people were expecting big things of uh, Bivon last night, but he got points decision win, 12 rounds under his belt. Um, Ron, overall impressed with Bivon, and is he the number one light heavyweight in the world for you right now? Or do you still think he needs to get in the ring with Baturbiev and sort of make, sort of show us against a better opposition what he's all about? Um... I mean, first of all, I just want to give you know Craig Richards a good sh- you know big shout out, and I think uh, all credit to him. You know, he saw the fight out, took some heavy punches, but he did. You know, it was back and forth. So, uh, as for your other question, is he the number one? It's only you know Vitaviev is the other uh, customer in that kind of division that they need to have that face off. Uh, I think mean, I think that's probably the next fight as well uh, for him, Bivol. I would have liked to have seen Bivol kind of close that show off, man, against uh, Richards last night. He seemed to have kind of been a bit more in cruise control. Uh, I think he had all those rounds in the bank, and you know, as a you know, we, we would have thought he would have put the finishing touches off and finished it off. But I think he kind of took the easier option and kind of saw that fight out. But nonetheless. You know, he, he won that. For, he got the win. And uh, then we'll, hopefully we can look forward to that. That, you know, kind of for all the marbles in the light heavyweight division. As if given the reputation that Bivol's got, going into that fight last night and coming out of it the way he did, was you overall impressed with his performance against Richards last night? No. You know, I've seen, yeah. I'm not going to lie, I, I've not seen many of his fights. I've seen snippets here and there and I've heard the name being thrown around and if the plan was to bring this guy over to the UK and capture a new audience and, and get people talking about him it in my opinion didn't pay off um, he's very small man like compared to Richard he was, he's, he's quite a small small guy um, I'm surprised you know he's, he's, he's as good as, as people say he is but I wasn't impressed but again you know something that we just talked about with Jr I think He's been inactive for a while. I think it was, I think it was about nearly two years, the last four, 18 months. So inactivity, as you can tell, it, it plays a big thing. Um, so, yeah, I, listen, I've heard his name thrown about, you know, and I've watched the fight, and I wasn't very impressed. I mean, he's, he is a very small, light heavyweight, and I think one mm. of them said last night that he should be at 168. Uh, but Herbiev is a wrecking machine. But Bivon last night, ring inactivity. Uh, but hats off to Craig Richards. Not enough. Uh, Craig Richards is a very good fighter. He's a British champion. Yep. Good fighter. Mm. And you know what? Yeah, one, I was going to say one thing about Bivol. Yeah, he doesn't waste punches, does he? He's no. that typical, East, you know, that Eastern European fighting style where they don't waste punches, man. His punch perfection was, you could tell, it, it, it was really good, but he was very hesitant at times. And... Yeah, like you said, he's very small, but that's the one thing that caught my eyes straight away. I think they were talking about maybe possibly going down away and, and challenging Canelo, but, you know... We'll now, do you know what? Canelo Bivol would be a brilliant fight because, as you said, he don't waste punches and neither does Canelo, but I think the fight that everybody wants to see at 175 is uh, Bivol Baturbiev or even a Joe Smith Jr. because that light heavyweight division right now, even some of the British fighters, Lyndon Arthur, Josh Buatzi, Callum Johnson, Andy Yard, and obviously Craig Richards, there's good fights to be made. you still got Badu Jack who takes on Jean Pascal. Hopefully that fight gets announced soon as well. Light heavyweight is a brilliant division, and I think it's one of the, the division that doesn't get the credit. But I would like to see Bivol and Maturbi of next. And as for Craig Richards, listen, he's got bags of experience under his belt. Now he's fought at British level, and now he's fought at world level. And when he does get a world title shot next, you'll see you'll see him more ready for it because like, he's nothing to be ashamed about last night. He took him the distance. I actually thought he won at least four rounds last night. Mm-hmm. That do him the world of good going forward into the rest of his career. Um, but nonetheless, hats off to Craig Richards and hopefully we'll see that big fight at, at light heavyweight between Bivol and Baturbiev. Let's move on because Sonny Edwards became the new IBF World Flyweight Champion on Friday night by beating Morati Muffalane. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, do you know what? That was a, an astonishing performance from Sonny Edwards on Friday night. Take nothing away from Muffalane, a great champion over the years. But Sonny Edwards really put himself on the map the other night by winning the world title he did. 
for me, that's one of the best performances from a British fighter in terms of winning a world title. And there's some good ones up there. Tyson Fury is against uh, Vladimir Klitschko in 2015, but this one's right up there. But when you look at the sort of smaller divisions, I don't think they get the credit that they deserve. I don't think it gets the recognition that it deserves. Asif, where do you rank that performance on Friday night? Yeah, it was like you said. It was it was one, it was one of the better performances. Um, I, I had him winning pretty comfortably, and going into that fight, it was talked about as a 50-50 fight. So to to win a world title with that ease, really, and to put himself, you know, right up there in the mix. Uh, you know, can only say positive things. So hopefully, uh, Uncle Frank gets him the the big fights now, and uh, we see a lot more of him. Rod, what do you do with Sonny Edwards next? Do you unif- do you get him to unify that division, or do you move him up a division? I'd like to see him uh, defend it, defend that title. Really. Um, so, well, he's won the world title, which is you know, a fantastic uh, achievement for him. So, can he can he you know get him another fight in that division? Um, and then move him up. I think. I think it might be you don't want to move him up too quickly, and then he gets found out. So, I, I think you have to. Um, I think Frank Warren is probably going to look at his options, see what what there who there is who, who potential opponents are for him. All right, do you know what? I've that performance is brilliant. I'm winning every round. Exactly. And yeah. Lane is a is an experienced fighter. He's bags of experience. Exactly. Yeah. Do that to him. And you to bear in mind one thing, Sonny Edwards has not even challenged that European level. There's a lot of mm. fighters that have, that have Exactly. Not- so, yeah. So you have to give credit where it's due. And, uh, you know, people are going to look at, oh, flyweight, super flyweight. Who watches these? Uh, trust me. If you if you know you're boxing, you know that Muffling is no joke. But listen, hats off to Sonny Edwards and another world champion that Britain has and another world champion in the Frank Warren stable. Final topic, Andy Ruiz returned late last night with a points decision win against Chris Ariola. Had to climb off the canvas. A lot of controversy dis- um, surrounding the decision. The- Ruiz said he's going to give Ariola a rematch. Ariola's reaction at the end of the fight was... Ron, what was Asif? You, we get, you get your say on the, um, the reaction, but Ron, what was your performance on Andy Ruiz's return last night? Was it the right decision? <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, look, let's just look at the you know the facts of it all. Ariola, four years old. How many losses has he got in his record? And he's like, that was his seventh oh, loss. Uh, <laughs> just he's competing with Chisora at the moment. <laughs> you know, this was supposed to be a warm up fight, trying to get him back into that heavyweight mix. And and Andy Ruiz is offering him a rematch. Why, yeah. mate? You know. You know, you were a world title holder, you know, only two fights ago. Uh, you know, it, but new trainer, you know, let, let's not forget that. Lost two stones in weight. So that's something he's still getting used to. Um, you know, he's going to lose a lot of pa- bit of power. Um, and, it, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm a little bit frustrated if he's going to have a rematch. And I think mean, he just needs to get back in that mix. You know, he's young, he's a young heavyweight as well, 29, 30, I think he is. Um, you know, I think he's going to be wasting his time fighting a, re- rematching a 40-year-old. As if, um, I know you've got a bit to say about the reaction of Chris Ariola. <laughs> yeah, dude, take it away. Forget the fight. Let's just focus on the reaction. I think he quoted Dr. Dre, did he? I don't know if I can swear, but I've got my kids around so I'm not bad. Like, you can suck my... <laughs> no way. He wasn't happy. But, um, listen... Again, inactivity, man. The guy hasn't fought for how long? You know, probably a fight he expected to come in and breeze through. And he got caught multiple times. He was hurt loads of times in that fight. The, the crowd reaction at the end said it all, man. He was booed out of that place. Um, and, and Ron hit the nail at his head, man. If the guy wants to make steps in the division and be at that elite level, he doesn't want to be giving rematches. Um, yeah, listen, he, he's in that pool, isn't he? The Dylan White, the... Uh, um, the Wilder, they're in that pool just below uh, Fury, Fury. You'd put him in the top five, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Just because of what he's achieved, and you know, he isn't a bad fighter, man. Even I know people will always think, yeah, he's just a, you know, he beat Joshua on his off day, and that was it. He's a, he's a fluke, but he's not a bad fighter, man. He's different from all the other heavyweights. He's different, you know. He's, mm. he's small. He's quick. He's got amazing. Known for his hand speed, he's got yeah, ferocious exactly. hand speed. Yes. Mm. So. You know, he's in that pool again and it'd be nice to see him come up against someone like 
Dylan White or maybe even Wilder, but I can't. I wouldn't want to see the rematch, man. Uh, maybe just for the interview, the post, the post match, <laughs> post fight interview, I'll watch it for. That's it. It's gonna be interesting to see because there are a handful of fights that you can make in this heavyweight division right now. For me personally, I think he'll give Ariola a rematch because of the reaction he got from the fans at the end. But I would love the thought of him fighting an, an Ortiz or a Dillian White. I think those three. That's a little. Yeah, he's still going. Yeah, yeah, that's a little mix you need to get going right now, but. Look, man, there's loads of fights to be made in the heavyweight division. Only time's going to tell what's going to happen. If we can't even get the two best heavyweights in the world fighting each other and confirming it, then who knows what's going to happen for the rest of the division. We saw Deontay Wilder return as well on the pads last week. So, listen, don't ruin him just yet. But that's all we've got time for on this podcast. As if, Ron, pleasure as always. Thank you very much for jumping on to the viewers out there if they haven't already. Like, subscribe and comment. Check us on all the social media platforms and to listen to this podcast and the audio platforms. Uh, the links are in the description. Lads, I'll see you guys next week. We'll all be celebrating Canelo, Canelo's defeat to Billy Joe Saunders. You've heard it here first. I'm picking Billy Joe Saunders to the throne. Canelo Alvarez next week. As if Ron, pleasure as always. And to the viewers out there, thank you for the listening to podcast 32 of the Lights Out Boxing Podcast. Thank you.